Hi there, and welcome to this Mad Sense video in which I share some of the what the bleep questions and answers about the experience of hearing voices. In particular, I want to talk about the structure of what I'm calling mad stories. So the, the stories that voices engage us in have a structure to them, and that's what I want to show you. So you'll perhaps remember in the experience video part one, I showed you how um, the phenomenon that we call voices use the vantage point that they created, uh, you know, which they claim to be you know, all seeing and omnipotent um, to introduce the themes of ancestors, um, religion, aliens, um, and conspiracy. Um, and because, you know, and, and how that then, you know, gave them a platform from which to sort of bleep really with my mind. So, um, so the next step then is to show you that um, there is a structure to, to the stories, you know, given that kind of vantage point that voices are, are able um, to create. And I'm going to do this by just uh, revising quickly the summary slide from the previous video, which highlights the key factors uh, you know, that shape the experience. And then secondly, I'm going to talk about three of those experiences uh, that are quite common across the hearing voices community. Uh, the one is the idea the, uh, that the voices you're hearing is you know, someone nearby, a neighbor or someone you know, um, uh, or and then the whole idea of uh, this you know, otherworldly phenomenon where voices introduce the idea, as I say, of ancestors, spirits, the revealed the, um, the religions, real, the revealed religions, multiples, and other sort of otherworldly um, interpretations. And then I'll talk a bit about the idea of how voices engage you in a conspiracy story. And I'll show you that, you know, although each of these are obviously set in very different scenes and scenarios, there actually is a structure to the story that is common um, to all of them that enables uh, voices to engage us in a way that creates conflict that they can actually sustain. Uh, and by continually sort of um, prodding us you know, in these uh, frames of reference that these scenarios create, um, you know, they sustain a way, as say, to engage us and create the conflict that leads to um, extreme states. Uh, I'll summarize those to show you how actually all, you know, all three of them really are set up with the same kind of structure. And then I'll summarize with a slide in which I talk about uh, putting the focus on the um, transactional nature of how voices engage you and show you that actually you know, each of these um, you know, statements is calling up a frame of reference that creates an experience as we sort of answer the uh, you know, that, that is the question and answer session, the what the bleep uh, does this mean uh, question that is the experience. And I'll show you that it's, it's about the transactions more than it is about the um, interpretations. So just uh, bringing forward this, the summary slide from the previous video, <clears throat> which described the key factors that shape the experience. Down here, I'm just showing our normal sort of process of perception. You'll remember that actually we receive a stimulus in a particular context that sets our expectation of it. Uh, a new piece of information arrives. It um, calls up a frame of reference, which engages our um, emotional systems, uh, which is our reaction to it. So this is a, a body reaction. So this is the brain-based side of it. Uh, you know, and of course, it, doing this sort of brings that particular information into our aware mind. And of course, we process that by exchanging information between different frames of references um, until we achieve an outcome that satisfies our um, emotional systems. And I describe you know, the outcomes uh, as being you know, in any number of kinds of frames of references that could be you know, answers, implications, interpretations, beliefs. And I introduced the, my story model as a way to think about the frames of reference, references in which our um, interpretations land. Uh, I then spoke about when you hear voices, what happens is you are presented with um, new stimuli that are unusual. They present in the aware mind, independent of the context that you're actually in. So they're independent of the you know, stimuli from your day-to-day -day, um, activity. The brain uh, recognizes them as signals, and you can see this from the fact that we have an emotional response to it. It's engaging our emotional systems in exactly the same way that any other um, external stimulus is. Uh, and that, you know, the effect of this phenomenology um, on the brain 
is that we become um, aware of the of this presence and the brain starts to account for it and in presence i include absence because you know absence simply leads us to anticipating when it might happen again so we're constantly aware of it and the brain certainly has recognized it uh, as a source of stimuli and is is checking it um, you know this phenomenon that we call voices is able to change the phenomenology in in different ways one of those is to make it more invasive so it kind of comes closer for example increases the tempo gets louder these are things that are you know that you know engage our emotional systems more powerfully and that's what i mean by invasiveness they introduce all sorts of variety so distance clarity direction uh change of tone uh, you know, all of those kinds of things, these different forms of variety are just ways of actually, from, you know, from the brain's perspective, it's getting the brain's attention. So all of these, you know, these bottom three uh, rectangles here are preparing the brain and getting it ready to, to, uh, to receive the content that voices introduce. Um, and of course, you know, what this is doing is engaging, uh, engaging attention and bringing your focus to whatever it is that voices say. And I spoke about, um, you know, that this is slightly different for different presentations of the phenomenology. So it's slightly different with the, you know, whether you're experiencing this new piece of information as a thought um, intrusion, for example, uh, or whether you were hearing, um, you know, sounds or noises or voices talking to each other at some sort of um, distance, or whether your the phenomenology was presenting in a way that engaged directly with your thoughts with uh, what voices have to say uh, being broadcast and, and my thoughts in response being broadcast in the same space, which is what we call a thought echo. And I described that each of these, you know, these moving this way, you know, down this sort of arc um, are more invasive. And of course, they, they provoke particular types of questions, uh, which as I say, are actually quite um, um, predictive. So it provokes our own thinking, which leads to interpretations that we might um, uh, arrive at. Um, and then at the same time, voices kind of introduce this idea that what this connection is, you know, this connection is doing is it offers them a vantage point, which they claim to be um, all seeing and from that um, um, all knowing and then omnipotent. Um, but of course, that actually is the experience of it combined, of course, with what voices are, are actually saying. So, you know, this Greggy boy here, you can't swear on the web, uh, you know, is, you know, the web is this thing that voices are describing that connects me to voices, voices to each other, uh, uh, and of course, voices to everybody else um, on the planet. So that's the kind of vantage point that they claim uh, from which you know, they are all, um, as I say, all seeing, which they try and escalate um, to to um, omnipotent uh, and then of course what that does is that then it creates another whole bunch of interpretations that are driven by the phenomenology uh, this connection is something that we actually experience and then of course what voices say is another piece and of course what that leads to is all kinds of interpretations uh, implications uh, um, and beliefs uh, all of which are the experience as that information is, you know, you know being engaged in our processor, you know, it is producing um, emotions of, say, of course, some of those are extreme. And of course, then, uh, you know, voices are uh, sometimes asserting what they are. So we have these two kinds of beliefs. You know, the one is something I'm interpreting from the information that is presented. So in my first episode, I reached the very logical conclusion that the voices I, you know, that I, that the people I could hear were my upstairs neighbors because at that stage I didn't have the frame of reference called voices. Uh, but that was an interpretive um, um, belief. Uh, and then of course, voices came along and claimed, of course, to be um, ancestors, God, the devil, an evil God, aliens, you know, all of these things. So voices were asserting particular things, which of course you may or may not believe. And of course, um, I rejected. And of course, they introduced, um, you know, religion, obviously, uh, through this process, uh, but also they used this uh, phenomenological um, connection, which is, you know, it's a feature of the phenomenology through which this phenomenon and I are sharing information. And beyond that, I don't actually know. I don't know the implications of what can be shared beyond that. Um, but of course, that's what they used to introduce the idea um, of conspiracy. Uh, and of course, this creates extreme states, some of which spills over into behavior. And of course, the people we live with through our history have observed that 
and reach their own um, cultural interpretations of what this is about. Uh, of course, aided and abetted by what voices themselves have claimed to be God, for example, and all the other uh, spirit um, beings that go with that um, particular uh, system of belief. So the beliefs uh, then are you know, either things that we're interpreting from the information that's presented. So I reached the conclusion of the neighbors, but voices are asserting, voices saying, I'm God, I'm the devil, you know, or uh, cultural beliefs. And of course, all of these beliefs serve to shape the experience in some way, because of course they shape how we're interpreting the information. And in practice, they, you know, they typically make the experience more intense, more extreme. Sometimes, you know, they can actually, of course, make the experience um, less intense. And I'll talk about that at some other stage to say, you know, kind of how that works. But the key thing that's happening here is that, you know, all, all of this, all these stimuli, so the, you know, what voices are saying presented in these unusual way, in this unusual way, those two things together uh, create uh, new kinds of relationships. Uh, and I say it's either a new relationship with myself or with my mind. Uh, so not uncommon, you know, we say with the thought intrusion that I add this actually puts the focus, you know, on the mind and on my thinking. And of course that leads to interpretive beliefs such as in thought broadcasting. And of course that makes me start to wonder about, uh, you know, am, are other people hearing what I'm thinking or am, am I hearing what other people are thinking? Uh, and of course that's actually not the case. And what's really happening is we're getting this relationship with self in the mind. Uh, that's an unusual, you know, a new unusual relationship that's created just by virtue of the phenomenology. And the other one then is a, you know, a relationship with the phenomenon that we call voices itself. You know, so here in particular, you know, so I find some of our voices have particular character and personality. And at some point as they have claimed to be um, ancestors, particular ancestors, uh, God, the devil, and evil God, aliens, all of these kinds of things. So this then is a relationship with an entity that you experience as a sensitive ent sentient entity that we um, are calling um, uh, voices. So with sort of person personality and character. So these are the things that generally shape um, our experiences. So what I want to do is then kind of say, well, how does that create uh, some, some fairly common experiences that we see across many voice hearers? I say, and the three that I'm going to talk about are you know, it's the neighbors uh, or, and religion and conspiracy. Because uh, I say they, they, they appear kind of quite often. And I'll show you that actually uh, the reason for that is that the structure, this platform that voices have created through this vantage point is what actually enables uh, those stories uh, in the form that we actually experience. We, we, we experience them. And just so that you understand what my FOR stands for, it is um, frame of reference. So first of all, I want to talk about you know, the belief that it's, it's the neighbors or it's the roommate. Uh, you know, and as, as I showed you in my first episode videos, although I firmly believe that's what it was, it was my neighbors, it clearly, it clearly wasn't. So this actually um, um, is a belief. And the reason um, you know, that, you know, that I say that you know, it's a belief as opposed to a fact uh, is that it was a very logical belief. So in the beginning, I heard the sound of a man and a woman talking about what I was doing. They obviously had to be able to see what I was doing. That could only be done from this fire escape out here. The only people with access was the upstairs neighbors. So within minutes, I'd reached the conclusion that it had to be the neighbors. Of course, I didn't really like that answer. Uh, and, if, uh, and, and I say on day one, of course, I rationalized why my neighbors would be uh, uh, checking, uh, checking through my window to see what I was doing. And I rationalized that by saying I'd hurt myself that afternoon and perhaps they were checking up on me. Uh, and I say in my case, I actually did run up the stairs uh, later on and uh, just to you know, let them know that I was actually okay. Uh, and then and sort of dropped it um, at that point. But then of course, when voices continued the next day, that um, explanation was no longer reasonable. Uh, and of course, that very quickly escalated to you know, a discomfort and a feeling of course, that my neighbors, um, you know, were, were not acting um, properly. Um, but of course, if I, if I simply look, um, you know, at, of course, at the, you know, at, sorry, and that lasted until voices started to follow me outside the apartment, uh, which then, of course, meant that the likelihood that it was my neighbors, you know, that, that I could hear uh, seemed less plausible or less probable. Uh, so that sort of kind of shift just in location of where I heard voices changed my frame of reference and provoked a whole new range of questions about what this thing was, you know, or who, who I could hear. 
Uh, and of course, it wasn't until I went to the doctor in week seven or eight, uh, and he described it as auditory hallucinations, that I had a new frame of reference for understanding it and, of course, experiencing it. And that actually is the key point, is that you know, a new frame of reference brings a completely new experience of voices. And I'll show you that actually, you know, this is what's happening you know, in this experience of it, is voices are throwing in this little piece of information that you know, is in conflict with what I'm doing in some way, that's engaging my processor, and then of course voices are peppering me with comments, and what they're doing is they are directing you know, my frames of reference or calling up new frames of reference, and of course you know, that's the stuff that the mind is actually evaluating, uh, this, you know, the, the information that it has in, the, in, in, in those frames of references, that the brain is calling up automatically in response to this new stimulus um, that has arrived. So what happened here, of course, was that the phenomenon presented this, um, you know, the two voices talking about what I was doing. It was out of context. Uh, you know, so that's what got my attention. So of course, that's what provoked the questions, the, you know, the question and answer session. Of course, the questions were, well, who is it? The answer was, it had to be my upstairs neighbors. And of course, it was a male and a female voice, and there were a, you know, it was a male and a female couple living upstairs. So it mimicked reality, and of course, that was providing a little bit of um, corroborating evidence. Um, so in that evidence-seeking process, I reached the conclusion, you know, very logically, you know, or the belief that it was my neighbors. Uh, and of course, I say, whilst that was a satisfactory explanation on day one, by day two, three, four, five, of course, it was no longer a satisfactory uh, well, no longer a reasonable explanation. I had no, I had no alternative. And of course, what they did was it created doubt, which is what escalated the emotions. And of course, the problem was that with it was that it became very difficult to verify, you know, or not that it was the neighbours. And of course, this was, you know, one thing was that um, uh, if it was the neighbours uh, and I approached them, they would simply deny it anyway. Uh, and number two. Uh, I was renting this apartment furnished from somebody, you know, it was a temporary sublet. My name wasn't on the lease. Um, and of course, I didn't actually want to um, upset the apple cart, you know, in this apartment building uh, and make it difficult for my uh, landlady because I actually didn't know the neighbours. And of course, what this does is it makes the problem unapproachable and it makes it very, very difficult to verify what is going on. And of course, this is the catch-22. Uh, that voices have trapped you in. They presented a piece of information that leads to a strong belief, that also creates doubt, and of course it puts you in a situation where actually it's um, it's difficult uh, to 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 verify the information. Uh, and of course, what that's doing is it's trapping you in this kind of untenable situation where you don't know what to do because actually my options are I can go and talk to the neighbours. Um, but by this stage, you know, by day three, now that the experience is particularly uncomfortable, uh, and I say, I, if they say no, it's not them, I'm unlikely to believe them. So, you know, so so what's the point? Um, you know, so unless they've heard of the phenomenon of hearing voices and managed to put two to two and two together in a two-minute conversation at their door, you know, it's not actually going to it's not actually going to get you anywhere. Uh, so, so of course, what I did was I sought help and you know asked. A friend to come over and you know, a landlady and of course uh, you know that just sort of got in the way uh, in some way uh, and of course what that led to then was you know it was the was the implications for me were that there were no privacy so from here on now of course this is my own particular um, interpretation and response uh, but I said what what happened is voices have created this scenario and of course for me the implications were that I had no privacy it was a uh, rented apartment, I could give note, notice on a short-term basis, and I did. I decided to move out. Um, but of course, in the meantime, I also started going and working in an internet cafe, uh, sorry, in a cafe nearby. And I you know, did a lot of work on checking my PC and looking for cam cameras, all that kind of wasted stuff, um, wasted effort. But what was happening in the meantime was that I was updating my perception of the character of the neighbors who went from caring to nosy to intrusive to spying um, on me. And of course, what that's likely to lead to is uh, you know, a belief um, you know, at some point in the evidence that I see is liable to diminish you know, my trust in people around me. Uh, and I say, if I, if I just set this in another scenario, you know, it's not unusual for you know, some people who hear voices to be sharing a household 
uh, with someone and they'll have a room in somebody's home. Um, and of course, what happens is voices have created this suspicion um, about um, uh, you know, somebody else nearby, perhaps somebody even living in, this, in the same household, say a roommate, I've seen you know, uh, several people with this kind of situation. And of course, what happens is they get into the same position, uh, they become suspicious, uh, you know, uh, approaching the person is kind of untenable, it's going to increase the conflict, it's not going to solve the problem because if they are actually uh, guilty, they're simply going to deny it anyway. And the person, I say, is caught in this um, in this catch twenty two, uh, and you know, is is it, and of course loses trust in the individual. Uh, they create the belief that the individual is actually behaving um, um, suspiciously, and of course, once that happens, you you start to see it. And all that has to happen is you go out one day, you come back, and you see something on your desk that you think is in a slightly different position. And gosh, that's a new piece of evidence that confirms this suspicious belief. And we ignore the fact that we might have gone in and out another hundred times in that month. And of course, everything was in exactly the same place. Uh, and of course, unfortunately, that's the way these kinds of beliefs work. Is a kind of um, you know, a belief, state of mind, a piece of evidence that confirms that belief. And of course, unless you're able to uh, you know, disprove it or prove it in one way or another, you're stuck, as I say, in this kind of catch-22 situation. I say the, un the unfortunate um, consequence of that in terms of, of real life was that, you know, this what I call a pesky fact, is that voices had presented this um, fake problem, uh, you know, which I experienced, of course, as very, very real. It came with lots of um, soap opera and, um, you know, high emotions that, I say, eventually led to a panic attack when I checked into the hotel and discovered I couldn't get away from voices. Uh, but I say, when you step back, one has to look at it and kind of said, I wasted a lot of effort, time and money on, um, on moving, on fixing my PC, on working in a nearby cafe. And it was all, um, all a complete um, waste of time. And really all that was happening was that, you know, voices had provoked my mind by introducing this piece of information, male and female voice talking about what I was doing, which was out of context. You know, so against my expectation, that's just what the conflict is. And of course, they created a scenario in which uh, my evidence, seek, evidence um, seeking, um, you know, was something that they had a fair amount of control of. They were able to, um, you know, move uh, where and when, of course, um, I heard voices, you know, from one room to another and then outside the apartment at fairly sort of convenient um, times, if you like, to, to escalate my emotions, as I say, which of course led to this. And the problem is that this situation where voices can provoke and you're sitting in a situation where voices can direct your evidence seeking based on what they're saying, because that's calling up a frame of reference, um, but your real life situation is one where this belief and doubt are actually um, going to persist because it's actually you know, an unapproachable um, problem. Um, so that's the sort of basic um, you know, structure of the sort of neighbor story. And remember what this is, is you know, this is very much about my world initially, and then about me, certainly by the time I've got the you know, description of auditory hallucinations um, from uh, the doctor. You know, I said this is very much you know, the sort of macro frame of reference is me and my world. Um, um, but I say a completely fake problem, lots of emotional drama and a total waste of effort in terms of what I was trying to do um, to solve that problem. And this basic idea actually persists. So what happened when voices introduced the idea of initially sort of ancestors, number one, then secondly, uh, specific ancestors, so people that I knew, number two, of course, and then the idea of religion, first of all, as a topic that they were provoking me with, sensitizing me to, and then making this big show of actually introducing God who uh, asked me to uh, rewrite the Bible. Uh, of course, you know, although I kind of, I'm not religious uh, and I actually don't believe um, uh, in God. In fact, I believe, you know, that all that happened is that, you know, the, the major prophets were, um, had, had heard voices and experienced extreme states. Uh, voices claimed to be God exactly um, as mine did. And what's different is that in, you know, whatever it is, six, 7,000 years ago, when this first started to happen, or 2,000 years ago, um, you know, the, there was a belief in gods that was prevalent in communities at the time. So when a voice came along and claimed to be God, 
uh, you know, a god or, or god, the god, uh, you know, people were more inclined to believe it. Uh, of course, I rejected it. Um, and it, whether or not I rejected it, voices were able to e impose the experience on me um, simply by saying that actually, you know, what I thought didn't matter. Uh, that, you know, that of course the voices were God and then later on, say the devil, and then later on an evil God, and that I was in fact the second coming, whether or not I, you know, whether or not I liked it um, as a way to engage me um, in this war between good and evil, which is the experience that voices, of course, actually imposed on me, um, as I said, simply by as I say, claiming to be God, I say, and then the devil. Uh, and then declaring me to be, um, you know, to be the second coming. They, you know, they imposed, you know, all these voices, visions, dreams, body sensations, uh, and more um, on me. Rather impressive and sometimes terrifying special effects that, that voices imposed to make a point and to punish uh, and to torture uh, and to threaten, um, which is really not very really, um, pleasant at all. But of course, what that does is this pulls the sort of frame of reference in which I'm seeking evidence into this other world where voices, of course, claim to have dominion, if you like, and claim to know everything. And of course, it's in a world, uh, this other spirit world about which uh, obviously I can't know anything. And of course, they use that to claim that I can't understand. Uh, and of course, um, nonsense, I say to that. Uh, but of course, what it does, of course, for voices is they suddenly create the rules and anything goes. Uh, and of course, I am experiencing it as this otherworldly thing. It's these unusual stimuli presenting in the aware, in the aware mind that are disconnected from what I'm actually doing. We, uh, as humanity, have a history of it, which has resulted in many, many, many different cultural beliefs, and some of them very specifically instigated by voices. For example, uh, you know, the whole idea of three different religions all originating in the same geography, which happened to be very conveniently located on the migratory routes sort of from south to north, Africa to Europe, and east to west, Asia to Europe. Um, I think that's actually by design. Um, but of course, what it's doing is it makes the problem unsolvable because I'm now working in a, in a field where you know, the evidence is A, lacking, and B, you know, and B, I can't prove nor disprove anything. All I can actually see is the great deal of conflict, of course, that it has that it has caused, uh, you know, both between both the kind of conflict that I'm experiencing between voices and myself, making the using beliefs or assertions that I, you know, that voice is God or the devil or both as one as an evil God, um, you know, to make the experience of it, of course, very very intense uh, and of course exaggerated by the special effects that come with phenomenology. What's happened? What's happened? Uh, and giving me a specific role in solving this problem. Um, of course, voices have made it unsolvable and created this catch-22 situation again. So what they've done is they've created this scenario, which, you know, which they can use to create everlasting conflict. And of course, that seems to me to be uh, what they have kind of tried to do. And then of course, voices have tried to impose implications on me. Uh, so in addition to the ones that I think of, which are the experience of it, there are others that voices have tried to impose on me, uh, which of course is another experience because every piece of information they're throwing at me is calling up a frame of reference and engaging my processor. As I said, I've learned to interrupt that and replace it with something else. Um, but unless you're doing that, you're having that full on kind of experience of it. So of course, I say what, what happened for me here is that in spite of my rejecting these voices and you know, pushing back on them saying what they are simply by asking, well, where's the love? Where's the respect? Where's the value? What does it do for you? What does it do for me? It's an easy way to push back. Voices say it doesn't matter. They don't care. Uh, you know, I'm experiencing this thought connection and they're saying you are the chosen one. And of course, chosen one has many variations ranging from you're the second coming to you're our victim, to you're our um, hero, to you're our pet project, to all kinds of variations on this theme um, of being chosen in some way. But really, each of them is just a way for voices to change the, the, the spots on the role that they have for me. You know, so it's wearing one outfit this week, a different outfit um, uh, next week. Um, so I chose to be Pope Greggy Boy, for example, because I like the idea of being infallible. Voices played with that a fair bit. 
Um, you know, it wasn't the only character that I adopted or that they sort of imposed on me, but all of them were just different ways for voices to make threats and promises or to encourage or discourage. And of course, what each of those are doing, encourage, discourage, or either they're exaggerating your emotions. Uh, and of course, that's what's leading to, uh, to the extreme states. And no matter what interpretation I reached, because as I say, I pushed back on voices, I didn't like any of their um, assertions because they were downright malevolent. Uh, and of course, I simply said, where is the love and where is the respect? Because that's what I live by. Uh, and I can believe in that uh, without uh, religion. In fact, it's what I do to, it's what I use to reject religion. Uh, and of course, voices simply say, well, we don't care. Uh, and of course, that's what I mean by the fact that voices um, ex impose the experience of being the second coming to God, the devil, and an evil God. So for me, they made the experience of it true, even though I believe that it's not true, in the same way you know, that they claim to be God as true. Uh, and I say it is actually not true. It is actually simply, simply a claim. Uh, uh, and we're certainly not uh, certainly you know uh, nothing loving about it because this character cannot possibly be part of any um, loving plan. But of course, what that does is it shifted my frame of reference in particular ways. So you know, voices were pushing me towards thinking about religion uh, much much more than I ordinarily would. It stole a huge amount of my huge chunk of my mind share. You know, I spent an inordinate amount of, you know, of time on this. Uh, but of course, because you know, I don't actually you know, accept um, you know, these voices um, at all, let alone um, as God. Of course, uh, you know, the evidence that I see is that actually this has been a crime against humanity. Because for me, actually, this phenomenon is a phenomenon. Uh, I think the voices probably actually are connected, and the structure to stories for me kind of points towards that. Uh, and in fact, you know, the crimes I'm seeing against humanity are you know, from this phenomenon of voices, the experience of hearing voices and the extreme states that it creates. And of course, one flavor of interpretation of that is the, uh, is the revealed religions, uh, and so for me, which actually set us against each other um, and create conflict in the same way that voices you know, have done to individuals up here. And again, as I say, you know, I'm describing this as, as pesky, pesky facts. It's an understatement. Voices are creating a fake problem by claiming, you know, to you by using this advantage, this vantage point to claim an influence on the world of the person who's hearing them. But in fact, some of that is spilled over, you know, into say cultural beliefs um, about God. And of course, um, you know, what happens is, uh, you know, voices have created a fake problem, saying you're a sinner, and they're offering a fake solution because actually, you know, the solution is through the same um, phenomenon. Believe me, it's fake. Um, and uh, or if you're kind of as a, you know, a a hearer stuck in this situation, you know where it's a really going to be difficult. You know, it's a pretty difficult job for me to convince you of all of this. For example, they made the problem unsolvable, and of course that's how they put me in this kind of catch twenty two situation. So I wasted a lot of time on this, and of course humanity has wasted an awful lot of uh, millions of man years on rationalizing. Uh, why this phenomenon is actually good for us because uh, we would like it to be because we want to believe uh, you know, in, in something like this. It doesn't mean it's true at all. It's kind of simply belief. And of course, the moment I kind of, you know, pick a phrase, uh, you know, the first three of the, well, first three of the, of the um, Ten Commandments include a threat. And when I say that to someone, they say, oh, but that's not what it means. Uh, well, actually, <laughs> I'm focusing on what it says. What it means is what you choose it to mean. And of course, this is the conflict that voices have managed to create, is that we've just been caught in this world of interpretations and beliefs. And at this level, we're unlikely to um, agree at all, uh, unless I say a community has sort of got together and agreed in some way and found a, you know, and made it a uh, part of community and um, sort of lifestyle, which of course is another one of the uh, problems of the revealed religions is because through that, they um, in, indoctrinate people uh, and you know, encourage these beliefs from such a young age that people don't actually make the choice themselves. Um, in practice, again, the individual is the same thing that's going on. Voices are using the phenomenology to provoke. So it's literally engaging my mind, engaging my emotional systems, mostly in an unpleasant way. They're making these outlandish statements. 
uh, which is why I'm using the capital P coming from Ed De Bono's teaching of creative thinking, you know, in which you, uh, you know, posit that an outlandish statement is true and use that to shape your thinking in a different way. This is pretty much what voices are doing. And again, I say they're, they're setting up this catch-22 situation, where as, an, uh, as, a, as a voice hearer, my evidence seeking is creating the extreme states because I'm assessing all these implications uh, and the consequences of these uh, threats and promises that voices um, are actually making. And of course, the problem is much bigger than me. It's in this uh, otherworldly sphere. Uh, and for an individual, it makes it completely unsolvable. And of course, this is exactly how voices are able to perpetuate the state of conflict. Uh, and in fact, to me, they seem to be, have been striving to create the um, everlasting um, conflict. So same idea with, um, with conspiracy. What I want to do here is insert um, one more slide before doing a similar one. It's actually just highlight how actually uh, voices can use a little incident uh, or a little action that you take uh, you know, to exaggerate um, signal strength. So what's happening uh, in the previous two slides is once a belief is formed, uh, a, a stimulus that arrives that fits that belief, of course, uh, is recognized with a much, much stronger signal. That's one way that that happens. I simply want to show you that actually there are other ways that that, that happens with voices. And I'm you know, showing how voices actually evidence, uh, distort how we view evidence in the mind. And I'm going to use a conspiracy story as um, an example. Uh, so what I'm doing here, I'm using the my story model that I've introduced before to simply represent me getting on with my life and my day. That's the stuff that we do. Uh, of course, what's happening in the world that we live in is there's um, you know, been quite a bit of noise you know, over the last few years, several years actually, about different kinds of conspiracy. I'm actually going to use this particular one. where It's you know, it Snowden thought that our rights were being undermined. Uh, you know, by this kind of security system uh, that we have that we have in place. Um, of course, what's interesting about this is that actually this is a topic that is that is in the news. So these stimuli actually are coming uh, from the environment, the you know the way you know, from the, polit the political situation that we're that we're living in, um, if you like. Uh, but of course, how voices are using this is they're using this to condition the brain to create a context. Uh, in which the individual hearer is actually in, um, engaged. So what's happening is, you know, we, 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 this is the stuff that creates sort of paranoia and fear, which is the primary driver of the need for care and and uh, you know, institutionalization or you know night stays in hospitals. This, this was driving the sort of cost the the cost up. Is voices use this kind of scene you know, of a real life scenario, um, you know, which is a theme that's actually in the news that has you know high sort of emotional content to it because it's about human rights so we're all connected to it in some way uh, and voices are able to create theater around it i don't just mean that it was in the theaters i mean voices use it to create theater in the mind so through suggestion through high levels of activity you know when you're thinking about the stuff or seeing um, news about it uh, they're actually conditioning the brain to be um, hyper vigilant and hyper aware and ready, if you like, to focus on information that is relevant to this topic. They're increasing its significance, its significance in your life transactionally simply by being busy you know, around this kind of theme and then through suggestion and what they say, creating this kind of sense of, of suspicion or some other sort of state of mind so that um, all that has to happen is that you need to you do something. So, for example, you know, click on a link on a story in sort of Facebook that is really relevant to this and voices then sort of pounce on that little activity uh, by getting very, very busy and very, very loud about this topic. Of course, bringing it into the a mind in a state of conflict, declaring all sorts of outcomes about what this means um, for your future, engaging you in this conspiracy in some sort of role. Um, uh, and of course, uh, whilst I'm busily trying to think about what that, um, what that means in this threatened state of mind that voices have managed to create, they've engaged the mind with all these claims and threats about what it means for me, which I don't like. So they're asserting these outcomes predictively. And of course, that's engaging my emotional systems. You know, and because, you know, so in, in my case, you know, I was off on this quest anyway, 
I was going to you know, solve this problem of understanding um, the hearing voices phenomenon. Uh, of course, once they engaged me on the idea of um, religion, I was going to you know, help the world understand that the revealed religions are simply um, a product you know, of the hearing voices phenomenon. And of course, because they introduced the idea um, of um, conspiracy, and I'm actually very interested, of course, in politics and in human rights. If you start to look for evidence of conspiracy, it's not that difficult to find it, because conspiracy is the kind of thing that's typically hiding in um, plain sight. But if you look at a whole bunch of incidents together, you can actually quite easily make an argument um, you know, uh, about different kinds of um, conspiracy. But because I was engaged kind of you know, in, in this um, quest, uh, and I say, and then voices you know, are inventing these you know, stories in which the, the hero has a role and it's either the hero today or the villain tomorrow or a victim the day after. This is how they create the kind of um, soap opera as an experience, of course, which we're experiencing as a story. But as I'm seeking evidence, I'm in this space where I'm reaching unusual explanations because it's a field in which I don't have all the information. Uh, a lot of it is secret and not shared, what have you. So I'm going to reach interpretations and form beliefs. And again, the problem actually can't be resolved. And of course, voices are making all these assertions about what it means, not just for me, but for, for us, uh, you know, for our future. Because I say, uh, you know, if there is a conspiracy theory, of course, it is undermining um, human rights, uh, of course, which is of interest um, to all of us because it's part of the the world that we live in. And of course, this is how voices are exaggerating the size of the problem, number one, but of course, exaggerating the emotions that are associate, associated with it and are creating the extreme states. And if they've engaged your threat system and you're unable to find evidence that will get you out of it, of course, this is when you're quite likely to you know, run, in, you know, run out into the street and do something um, crazy. And that's the, you know, the episode, as I say, that then becomes part of your story, particularly if, if it happens often, even though it isn't really um, um, part of your story. So the thing that I did, as opposed to a click on a, a Facebook link about um, Ed Snowden, was that in one of my um, stressed states when voices had badgered me and I was feeling uh, very insecure, I actually um, checked into a hotel uh, in Cape Town because um, I was where I was. Um, at the time and of course it just was just a way for me to, to feel secure i mean if i hadn't been able to afford that i might well have landed up you know in an institution at that point um but really i so said what i did was i checked into this hotel and because voices were sort of badgering me um about politics uh and conspiracy at that stage i had this information about the revealed religions it could change how we view politics it could change uh it could help create peace um, you know, not just in the Middle East, but world peace, if we actually understand how much of our conflict uh, comes from this, phenom this phenomenon, as opposed to real world um, problems. Um, uh, you know, as I say, I was actually on this quest, and of course, those are the things that, that voices were badgering about, and of course, the information that I had was very, very special. Uh, and of course, one of the things that I did was when I was in this hotel um, the first night, I think, I actually wrote a letter to Obama, This was not long after his election, um, uh, the first time, and of course I had voted for him, uh, uh, which is why voices were able to engage me with this. And I wrote a letter, which was to Obama, simply saying, if I were Obama, I would want to know. And I just listed a bunch of kind of conspiracy ideas, which kind of related uh, religion and politics and the military industrial complex together, um, sort of um, quite, quite predictably. And of course I asked the hotel to put it in the safe that night, uh, and of course, I got it the next day. Um, uh, but of course, my voices were able to use that incident. That was the equivalent of me clicking on um, a, a link on Facebook. And of course, what happened then is voices have forever since been saying uh, you know, that that letter got to Obama, that the government has been following me ever since um, the American government, well, not only the American government, governments have been following me and that they, they keep saying Obama will call. Uh, at some point when this is all resolved. But really all that's happening again here with this conspiracy is what's happened now is instead of the, the evidence frames of reference being in this other world, the supernatural world, for want of another description, supernatural for me simply means as yet unexplained. Um, the, uh, what voices have done is they've brought the, the evidence frames of reference down into the real world. So things as I say, like the news, something about um, 
um, Snowden, or for example, you know, our politics. So, you know, when Obama was in power, you know, Trump started the Bertha thing pretty early on uh, in his sort of presidency, you know, um, trying to, you know, discredit um, Obama. And of course, you know, late, fast forward, some pretty unusual stuff going on with Trump, you know, uh, for example, at the moment, to the point of the say where I actually stopped watching the uh, presidential nomination, the nomination campaign um, uh, on TV because I was just getting irritated by it and, you know, too, you know, and, and sort of too emotional. But the point is there is all these stimuli from your everyday life now, or news, um, are actually becoming part of the story. And of course, this is how voices kind of say that you know, the news is actually speaking to you. It's another fairly common um, problem. But what voices have done here is the phenomenon has created this vantage point, this connection between me and them. Of course, and they're trying to show me that they know stuff that I don't know and that they can slice and dice information however they like. Uh, and of course, that's the mechanism by which they can actually see that I'm involved in a conspiracy, whether or not I am. Uh, and of course, they just make these assertions. And of course, in making the assertions, it's engaging the brain, whether or not I believe it. And that's how they actually are creating the experience. So what's happening here is I've done something, um, you know, in, in a fairly unusual state. I mean, I ordin wouldn't ordinarily be writing a letter to um, Obama and asking the hotel to put it in the safe. Um, so they created that tenseness that led me to that, you know, but the evidence I was looking at comes from the real world, except of course that the evidence is full of secrecy uh, and it's security, you know, kind of related. And of course, again, the problem is much, much bigger uh, than me as an individual. And of course, you know, I, I don't have all the evidence and for me, it's actually unprovable one way or another. Uh, and of course, I'm in this catch-22 um, situation again. So again, I've got the provocation catch-22 that voices have trapped you in in the mind because there isn't enough evidence to lead you out of it and then the implications of course are something that I'm assessing based on my history um, but of course what voices are doing is they're asserting now that I am a threat um, to voices to the revealed religions and therefore to the uh, to the military industrial sort of complex and therefore to a whole bunch of politicians and leaders you know, autocratic leaders sort of around the world so that there are many many people to whom I am a threat um, uh, and the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so, and then because of that, I am under threat. And of course, they then keep making these, uh, they keep making these threats. And of course, that's what's creating the extreme states. And as I mentioned, that's the fear if they engage your, um, your threat system or the sort of paranoia where, you know, you're wondering whether what voices are actually claiming um, um, could be true or not. Uh, of course, so that's the stuff that's costing us um, uh, that's what's driving up the cost of care. And I said, I think we can actually do something about that um, uh, through education. I said, but the other thing is, of course, there are many, many interpretations you know, that derive from this. Uh, and of course, what voices are doing is they're encouraging me to act on them uh, in some crazy way, you know, to damage, uh, that will damage my sort of uh, credibility. And what they're saying to me, of course, is that because of this, you know, that I am a threat and under threat, I have a role, whether I like it or not. So here, they're not claiming that I'm chosen. They're simply you know, claiming that I'm involved, engaged in, implicated, you know, whatever, uh, you know, whatever it is. But the effect is the same, is that you know, I have a role you know, in this kind of thing. And of course, what's likely to happen in this scenario is you know, the beliefs that I'm likely to form you know, will be based on the evidence that I see. And of course, the one that my you know, voices, the voices I hear try to encourage was for me a distrust in authority. Um, but at the very least, as I say, we're quite likely to develop sensitivity to some or other theme in which we're unable to resolve the emotions, the extreme emotions that voices um, cause. And I say what does happen is, unfortunately, uh, people who hear voices, me included, we don't like um, to be told that we've developed sensitivities. Uh, we do. I didn't really see mine clearly until I mapped them. Uh, and I'll show you that in the mind, in the mind strategies. Uh, section, um, but I say this is actually how it happens, is that we've got this situation where the mind is being provoked, we're unable to find a solution, we're unable to get reasonable help, and of course those emotions build, and we become sensitive to um, particular topics. As I say, the practical outcome for me in this one you know, was not very significant. I simply stopped watching the political um, news programs uh, or opinion programs, they're not news, they claim to be. Um, uh, because actually I just found, you know, I was getting too frustrated by it and too angry at it and, you know, because I could 
I could see this conspiracy stuff happening and do nothing about it. So I just stopped watching it. Uh, was was the you know was the experience of it. And I say again here, the problem is that you know the pesky fact here is that actually if there is a conspiracy, it's actually independent of the experience that voices are imposing on me. Um, and there's not much I can actually do about it. I can recognize that some sort of politicians um, and leaders actually um, abuse it for power. I can see how um, you know um, some politicians are abusing our emotional systems you know to create a fake problem. The Mexicans are going to come over the border and they're going to you know rob you blind and kind of you know, rape you. Uh, is engaging the kind of threat system. Um, only I can solve it. Uh, is the engaging your SUE system. We're going to build a wall, terrible solution to what is a fake problem. Uh, and by the way, we're going to make the Mexicans pay for it. There's this sort of punishing kind of streak on it. That is just um, you know, engaging to me deliberately, engaging our emotional systems, you know, without actually giving people the proper kind of information. Uh, and of course, as I say, I, I saw a lot of that uh, and I became sensitive to it, so I stopped watching it. And of course, it made my life um, a whole lot um, better. Of course, there is a flip side to this because you know, I rate um, Obama highly, I voted for him. Um, and of course, uh, because I had you know, written this kind of letter to him, um, you know, encouraging him to look at particular things uh, you know, in sort of identity poly politics and how that was used. Of course, as I made sort of progress, uh, my voice has sort of morphed into making me part of what I'm calling a good guy conspiracy. So, of course, you know, they are still sometimes using this refrain, of course, that Obama will call. And I'm simply saying to them, well, maybe, maybe he will, who knows. <laughs> Um, as I say, as this experience is entirely independent um, of reality, and that's the point, and it's because voices have managed to, as I say, in the same way, provoke by introducing this information, you know, and it's in a space that we can actually neither prove nor disprove, certainly as uh, individuals. And I say, in this case, we're getting a lot of evidence from our environment. Um, um, and in the case of religion, uh, there are enough people who believe in that stuff to make it very, very difficult to do anything about it. So in both cases, the problem has been made um, incredibly, incredibly difficult to solve. So let me summarize that um, structure. So what I'm saying is actually uh, pretty much independent of the kind of story that voices uh, have engaged us in. You know, I may be talking about it's the neighbors or you know, it's God or it's the devil or it's a demon not possessed by demons. You know, or I see this sort of conspiracy theory the major difference about these things actually is that it is simply these three macro themes um, of uh, frames of reference. It's me and my world, very local. It's um, you know, other world, which is this, you know, this kind of thing, or it's the world I live in, you know, the, the sort of conspiracy thing. This one here may possibly be open to reality testing, but I say for me, it's actually an unapproachable problem that causes other problems. We far better solving it um, simply with, you know, uh, Psych psychoeducation material like this. Um, and of course, as I say, this one brings it into another whole realm where cultural beliefs are very much um, you know, getting in the way and can make the experience of it much, much more intense. Uh, as I say, or actually voices are just using what's in the news um, to introduce evidence that makes you know, what they claim uh, more plausible or credible. So this is how they're as I say, just distorting the evidence that we are seeing. And of course, through all of this, we're getting much, much stronger signals on pieces of evidence that are actually irrelevant. But of course, because we're getting strong signals, the brain, the brain, literally the brain is weighting them more heavily. So until the mind intervenes to reject them or dismiss that piece of evidence, the brain is actually calling it up based on the signal strengths that it's been, uh, it's been attached to when it was received. Okay. Um, but what's happening here, of course, is voices are using this platform that they've created to insert conflict in some way, which of course is engaging our emotions. So this is the emotional side of it. They're then using what they say and the difficulty of the situation, the difficulty of getting out of it to es escalate the significance and the implications and the consequences to make it more dramatic. So this is actually making the emotions that they've engaged much, much more extreme and exaggerated. Uh, and of course, you know, we don't have the information, particularly not at the time, not in the moment, because, you know, if particularly if voices have engaged our threat system, you know, that actually gives us effectively a frontal lobotomy and we don't really see the bigger picture. And of course, that's how voices lock us in this state of paranoia for quite long periods. 
um, uh, because they say we don't have the information actually to get out of it. Literally, the brain doesn't have the information to present to the individual, to the mind, uh, to get us out of it. And of course, voices are using the idea that this information is shared or not shared or secret or absent or this person has it and that person doesn't or you, Greggy boy, have it and the rest of the world doesn't. And of course, they're using all these kinds of things about who and who doesn't have information to create stories and exaggerate the drama. And of course, all that's happening is that um, from the information point of view of this process, you know, actually we're short of information and what we're open to is multiple interpretations, assessments of implications. Um, and of course, what happens is we form beliefs, most of which say in this space are actually unusual to the point that you know, psychiatrists are calling them delusional, as I say, which is an unfair um, description because in fact, what happens is we have very different evidence, uh, different signal strengths are confirming different sort of pieces um, of evidence. And in fact, we're operating in a space where it's very, very, very difficult to prove um, or disprove something. And of course, the mind is operating under conditions of stress when this is happening. And so, of course, when you're asking me questions about that, you know, you know um, from your desk or chair you know, in, you know, in, in your office, and I kind of, my, my responses seem confused. Uh, it's not, um, you know, that um, my brain isn't actually working. It's that the evidence chain uh, isn't actually there. It isn't logical. Um, of course, what voices are then doing is creating a role for me, uh, either um, by encouraging me to create one for myself. So I went off on a quest. Of course, they then tried to define the quest for me. You are the second coming. Uh, of course, and then I'm a threat to religion, big pharma, uh, the military, the military industrial complex, uh, you know, some specific governments uh, that I see as undermining human rights. Uh, you know, so of course, uh, they made the problem, you know, exaggerated and of course much much bigger um, than me but because I was a threat I'm under threat so they give me a role one way or another they're finding a role for me to put me in the middle of the problem and the conflict um, that they have actually created and then of course by you know, ensuring that I have um, some extreme states and outbursts and do some silly things like checking into a hotel for six weeks when I really didn't need to um, of course what that does is it damages my credibility and of course, it makes it much, much more difficult for me to expose voices um, for what they are or so they thought. <clears throat> um, but of course, what this is doing again is this is how you know the catch-22 trap is actually set. High emotion, poor information. I'm in the middle of it, and you know uh, my my sense of agency of getting out of it is so completely undermined that I'm actually stuck in it. And that's the basic setup that voices have managed to engineer for all of these stories, you know, that we actually um, experience of them. And of course, unfortunately, what happens is voices then, now that we're locked into this difficult um, scenario, is voices use that to create multiple scenarios uh, of all sorts of kinds, and they just keep rotating it. And, you know, new here, you know, new versions of the same story every day. Uh, and so they engage via promise and threat or encouragement, discouragement to exaggerate the emotions. Of course, um, you know, create suspicion, different states of mind, different beliefs that actually link to evidence, to activity, to what we're doing today. Because if they couldn't connect it to what I was doing day to day, uh, it would be much, much easier um, to dismiss. And of course, then as things unfold, they just play the game of probabilities. Some things work out, and of course, voices claim uh, that that's, it's because of them. They claim the good, and if things don't work out, they blame me for why it went wrong. You know, so the, it's just the, the blame game, that they, the claim and blame game um, that they play. And of course, you see this, um, you know, some very good examples of this in our um, religious texts, where you know, every war that we fought in the name of God, unbelievable, but we did. Um, you know, voices simply claimed uh, that it was it was God's doing that this particular side won. And of course, if they didn't, that particular side was blamed because someone in the team wasn't actually doing what it is that they were supposed to be doing. And that's exactly what's happening uh, with us as individuals um, that are hearing voices in whatever story format they're um, engaging us with. And uh, I say, unfortunately, what happens is that our cognitive bias and our um, and our beliefs, uh, you know, shape our beliefs and our interpretations and the evidence that we see. Uh, you know, so what happens is, uh, you know, this serves mostly to intensify emotions, 
sometimes it lessens, um, you know, it lessens emotions. I say, I find, so I simply reject it. So I'm proactively choosing ideas, principles to live by um, that actually lessen the intensity of this emotion. And I'll show you how to do that in the mind strategy section. Uh, the problem with it is, is that uh, you know, the neuroplastic outcome of this, the piece that's unseen, the way the brain is recording information uh, is leading to limiting beliefs, which we seldom um, actually sort of talk about. So I mentioned, you know, that voices severely knocked my confidence, for example. Uh, and then because they were just so uh, very active around, you know, the activities that I undertook, that might lead, you know, lead to another partner. So dating, going to a bar, uh, those kinds of things, they got very, very busy and I just stopped doing it. Uh, you know, what voices were doing was actually limiting, um, limiting, creating limiting beliefs, the confidence or limiting what I was doing because I decided it just wasn't worth it. But I could, you know, I could see the stuff, uh, which, you know, which is really annoying. And of course, some of the stuff spills over because when the emotions are uh, engaged and extreme, that will lead to irrational behavior. And of course, sometimes that Im impacts our story. I actually think we're weighting it too heavily. Uh, but of course, the other big thing is this incredible amount of wasteful um, thinking and activity. Uh, you know, voices introduce these themes that I would not have thought about uh, you know, much at all. Um, yeah, I might have about this one because I'm interested in politics, but I certainly would not have thought, you know, uh, um, about the re religion and the revealed religions and the structure of those stories, which, by the way, are actually very, very um, similar. <clears throat> Uh, and so, of course, the problem is the pesky effect here again is that what's happened is voices have used this vantage point that they're claiming you know, to be a point of advantage uh, you know, to create um, fake problems in a sustainable way, uh, which will actually um, endure until we reject it all. Uh, because that actually is our only option up here is that actually you know, voices will continue to insert this stuff it will still be in the space that we cannot actually discern what's real and um, what's not real. Uh, what we can discern is what's useful and what's not useful. And on that basis, we can actually uh, you know, take a decision simply to reject it. And that by far is by far the easiest way to do it because you take one decision and you get rid of, the, you get rid of uh, all the problems. Um, so uh, the stories all have the same structure, basically. Uh, you know, what's shifting is the frames of reference in which I seek evidence and all of those frames of reference in which I seek evidence lack the evidence that will actually get me out of that situation. That's the fundamental problem and in that sort of catch-22 situation, voices are able to uh, insert conflict that exaggerates my emotions and create extreme states, some of which, as I say, spill over into, you know, into um, behavior. Um, so, summary from this is that voice, voices have engineered this way to sustain engagement and emotional extreme states. They've engineered this way to sustain a, a state of conflict in the mind and between us. Uh, as I say, it's important both for individuals to hear voices, but you see it, you know, there's still over that in terms of the beliefs we have about this phenomenon in society are creating conflict between us. Um, and, uh, you know, the beliefs out of the revealed religions are undermining um, human rights. There are a lot of exceptions to it. I think we need to stop doing that. Uh, human rights come first. Um, you know, if you want to have these beliefs that are personal, uh, you, can't, you, know, you, you can't force others to, to, share, uh, to share your beliefs. Uh, and, of course, so then the other piece about this is actually that because of that, the structure is the same. The interpretations and what voices say uh, are a ruse for individual uh, and what's really happening is they've created this situation where the transactions that they create you know, are the piece that lead to the extreme states and cause um, neuroplastic harm. So to summarize that, we've seen this before. Um, you know, the problem I say, is actually a transactional one because of the neuroplastic um, outcomes that that leads to. You know, the effect of beliefs and interpretations is to intensify the experience, typically to make it more um, extreme. We're inclined to focus on the content Whereas what we should be doing is remembering that actually the phenomenology itself uh, creates this new interaction, which, you know, which then uh, enables unusual relationships of two types, primarily. The one is a new relationship with self, which is provoking the mind to think about me. Uh, and the other one is a new relationship with these other characters, 
and of course the characters might be characters that um, uh, you know that I've interpreted as or I'm happy to believe are or that voices have asserted are or that my culture believes in you know, so if my culture believes in shamanism you know in effect I'm having that cultural belief imposed on me and kind of you know my life is being um, redirected you know by the community to say you're a shaman I actually think that's very unfair uh, an unfair thing to do to somebody, you know, because you're actually taking away their choice about what they want to do um, in their life. You know, and I think we've got to recognize actually that these cultural beliefs are often, um, you know, not helpful for us um, um, as well. Um, I mean, there may be some benefits to them, we, but I think we can actually intelligently figure out what they are and we can um, discard the rest. Uh, and then, of course, I say this can be under, understood that this is creating a different type of effect in our processing. Quick reminder, our processing is we receive a stimulus in a context which engages our emotional systems you know, in our initial reaction. You know, these systems then hold our attention in a processing response until we reach an interpretation that satisfies our emotional systems. And from that, you know, the interpretations, uh, conclusions, um, answers, beliefs that we form of what translate to our behavior and outcomes in life. Of course, what's happening with voices is this thing is introducing new information with all these special effects that hold our attention. So they're being di you know, directly inserted into our processor and engaging um, our emotional systems that lead to these, what I'm calling episodes. So each thing that voices say creates this flurry of activity in the mind. And eventually some of those, you know, become pretty intense and extreme. Um, because voices are, say, are able to in engage the threat system and lock us into that situation by provoking us and putting us in the situation where we don't have the information that would actually lead us out of it. And of course, that's adding up to the um, lived experience in the mind. And of course, as I say, sometimes these things spill over into outcomes in life. So I say for me, thankfully, mine have been mostly a waste of money, where I've spent money you know, on hotels, uh, on all sorts of other things. Um, shopping sprees, um, you know, all sorts of other things which were a total waste, um, uh, sometimes fun, most often not, uh, but all provoked um, by, by this strange um, phenomenon. Um, so, of course, this is what is making you know, the experience um, very subjective. We don't have the information at the time in the experience that will make it objective. So, it's a very subjective experience. Uh, relationships, by their very nature, are pretty subjective. Although we can, of course, make them more objective by observing them. Um, uh, of course, we experience them as stories. And of course, as I said, that's actually the fun of them. That's really in, that, in normal life. The stories of our relationships with others are usually fun. Uh, or else we move on to another relationship, or at least I do. Um, uh, so what we're going to recognize, as I say, is that what this phenomenon is taking away the fun um, you know, in these things, say, by introducing the strange idea, the strange connection, to this uh, you know, other space that I say my voices are calling the web or in the air or on the plane, they had to have different names for it. But what it's doing, of course, is uh, that is where they are throwing in all this information that is upsetting our frames of reference to say that actually for lead to limiting beliefs, fear, paranoia, uh, all those things that are getting in the way of quality of life and driving up the cost, um, uh, not just of care, but the cost to communities. Uh, so what we've got to do is actually that the way to fix this problem is not actually is not through psychoanalysis of the individual. It's simply by recognizing that the phenomenology itself, through this strange um, um, connection, lends plausibility, and that's all it needs um, to some sort of connection between the individual and this unusual sort of phenomenon. The implications of that we don't know, uh, but of course the implications of that become part of the experience, because voices are asserting that using that to assert dominance over us as God and the devil, uh, your know, involvement in, you know, visibility of and involvement in a conspiracy, um, you know, as a means by which, um, you know, the government might be using, you know, skull to voice technology um, to create this problem and perpetuate an opportunity for the pharmaceutical industry. I've heard that before. Um, but really, I say, this connection and this unusual thing leads to these interpretations that are enabled by you know, content and story that has a particular, you know, a, a, sorry, a, yes, content and story with a particular structure that actually makes these beliefs um, more plausible. And these are things, these are just beliefs as well, by the way. So 
um, you know, the idea that it's my brain that has a chemical imbalance that is a problem is just a professional belief. The idea that it is actually um, you know, something that's happened in my past, the sort of psychosocial factor, is actually just a belief of a fairly large group of people who hear voices. Of course, you know, if you've been abused in the past and your voice is claiming to be that abuser, you will have a relationship again with that um, abuser, but it's again, it's a relationship with this phenomenon, claiming to be the abuser as opposed to the actual abuser, although the pattern will be the same. It might just be this love interest where voices have kind of, you know, it's the equivalent of, you know, it's my roommate. You know, I've now seen someone on Facebook that I like and voices kind of, you know, mimic that person, you know, and I think I have a relationship with that person um, you know, on, on, on Facebook. This is just a relationship in the mind. Um, you know, one of these. Uh, you know, I've heard some people kind of say that, you know, the government is, say, is using stolted voice technology to create problems for some individuals or to, you know, to spy on individuals, um, uh, you know, this kind of thing. So that's a mechanism by which the conspiracy could happen. And then, of course, so there's all these other worldly things, uh, you know, so beliefs, beliefs in ancestors that I think, you know, voices abused to create the idea um, of religion, um, you know, and their multiple. So all of these actually are just beliefs, as I say, in primarily these um, three frames of reference, me, my world, you know, close by, uh, the world that I live in, or otherworldly. And I say the other option we have is to reject them all. And of course, that's obviously what I recommend that we do, because what we need to do is focus over here at the phenomenology and interrupt it as soon as possible to prevent you know, all this harm. The um, uh, extreme state um, episodes, uh, the paranoia, the fear, and of course the interpretations that actually get in the way of us uh, enjoying our life. So this all, to me, knocks um, um, quality of life, and of course that's what we want to that we want to um, fix. So thank you for listening. Um, as usual, I would like to keep as much of this possible free for people who hear voices. To do that, I have a fundraiser called Someone You Know Hears Voices on CryDrise.com. If you're going to comment on social media, please use hashtag MadSense. If you'd like to develop the structure of these stories as a research project, I'd love to work with you. Uh, contact me here. And then, of course, as I say, there are all these other players that I've mentioned before that are, that are you know, actively making a difference in, you know, in the space that would also uh, welcome support. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it.